Long Point is one of these huge sand spits that sticks out into Lake Erie from the North Shore. Lake Erie Basin is one enormous big sand pit, and the sands move. The currents at Long Point go from west to east, and they carry the sand right into the deepest part of the lake, which is the end of the point, 35 kilometers from where we're standing. In this habitat, which is so dynamic, is where Fowler's toads make their living. All throughout their range, they'll live in places where there are sand dunes and sandy shores. They're a sand-adapted toad. I started studying Fowler toads for my doctoral thesis. This was in the late 70s. That's so how old I am. I had gathered information on the abundance of the Fowler toads. And right at that time, this is now the end of the 80s, early 90s, this is when herpetologists around the world began to realize get worried about amphibian population declines. And so lo and behold, I already had data. So I decided to carry on and see what they were doing. Early on, it was rated as being vulnerable. We revisited the species towards the end of the 90s, and then it was classed as threatened. We revisited it again at the end of 2000s, and it was classed as endangered. So its status has gotten increasingly worse. As I've been studying it, I don't think it's my fault. So what amphibians like this need are places to breed, and then they need some habitat away from the ponds where the adults can live and survive. We found out that it's not the adult habitat. The adults, as they grow, and once they leave the ponds, they do really quite well. The problem is, not enough little ones are coming out to replenish the adult population. So we're losing what we call recruitment. These are experimental ponds that the Canadian Wildlife Service put in a few years ago. The idea of them is to provide breeding sites for the Fowler toads. Because as you see in the background, all those reeds have grown in. Those are the invasive strain of the common reed, which is called Phragmites, or Frag, as we like to call it. That's taken over this marsh and removed all the breeding sites that the Fowler's toads would otherwise use. So the problem was, how do you deal with the Phragmites? And there were thoughts of, well, we could roll it, we could poison it, we could burn it, we could do what we want to it. And I suggested that what the Fowler's toads need are breeding sites. Let's just push the reeds back and provide some breeding sites. The ponds here are part of the project by my PhD student, Catherine Yagi, who is interested in the effects of density on the growth of the tadpoles and if that carries over into their lives as, as toads and juvenile toads on land. If you want to study frogs and toads, you have to go out at night. It's all night work. The males sing to attract the females. So all the breeding is at night. They're nocturnal animals. There's a team of six of us. We go out and survey the marshes, the ponds. Then we survey the beaches. So whenever we find a Fowler's toad, you have to catch it, measure it, identify the sex, take its picture. Every toad has a unique spot pattern on their back, like a fingerprint, so we use that pattern to identify individuals. Where did the toad go? We mark individuals with this harmless fluorescent powder on their back, and it's a temporary mark, allows us to know that we caught it already that night. What we're really looking for during the breeding season is mating pairs of Fowler's toads, and sometimes we do find them in the field. We go out the next day in the morning and look for any egg masses that were laid. So when you think of frogs laying eggs, what they usually do is lay them in big clumps, but with toads, they tend to lay them in long strands, and they've ranged from 4,000 to 7,000 eggs. Out of the thousands of eggs that are laid by these toads, I'd say only a very small percentage survive, about 0.01%. Very few get to be even tadpoles. Very few of those get to be toadlets. And the toadlets get eaten by anything. So very few of those get to be adults. Once we collect the eggs, we put them into the ponds in the protected enclosures so they can hatch out in calm, protected conditions. What we found is she's been able to document very, very well. You can grow little toads or you can grow bigger toads depending upon the density. If they're not so dense, they grow bigger. If they're really crowded, they grow less. So we can make toadlets of varying sizes, release them into the landscape, and see which ones do best, which ones move farthest, 
and which ones are better able to adapt to the landscape. The ponds were installed in 2012. The population estimates since then seem to be the same over that time frame, but we have been seeing more juveniles on the beach, so we're hopeful that they will become adults in the next few years. You know, there's a couple things that move scientists. One is what the scientists will always tell you, that there's the questions that are remain unanswered. There's the scientific questions, the urge to know and understand things. There's so much that I wish I knew about amphibians in general that I can approach using this species that I know pretty well by now to address some very fundamental questions of ecology and amphibian biology. I don't think there is. Is that cool? Then there's the other one. Why study tongues? If you ask a biologist, why does he study whatever it is that he or she studies, they really do love what they do. They love the species, they want to understand it, they want to know it. You have emotional attachment to what you do, to those animals. I don't want there to be a world without toads. That's why I do it. Thank you.